and uh, welcome to this third Mercy's project webinar. Uh, we're getting a bit more used to this uh, method of uh, relating and communicating with people. Uh, and it's all to do with marine ecosystem restoration. Um, it's all part of a project funded by the European Commission's Horizon 2020 programme for blue growth. Uh, and it's called MERCES. That, that stands for Marine Ecosystem Restoration in Changing European Seas. Uh, and we're now well into our fourth year. So there's plenty of material on our website that you can see here, the link to. Uh, and this is our final year as well. So we'll be ending our operations at the end of May to 2020. Uh, you'll find many of the details of our research uh, on, on the website. Uh, we're pleased to be uh, working with Grit Arundel to bring this webinar to you. And I'm also very grateful to my co-convener, uh, Eva ramirez Lodra, of Re both the Rev Ocean and the Norwegian Institute of Water Research, uh, in, who has done much of the organizing for the, the, this, this particular exercise. Uh, we're pleased also that uh, Equinor have provided financial support for the webinar and indeed some of the science that's been uh, conducted in Mercies. To fulfill the aims of blue growth, uh, which uh, the European community require of us, we are trying to bring together industry and policy makers and decision takers and scientists and academics all together to, to really promote best practice in marine ecosystem restoration, all the way from the coast and into the deep sea. Uh, and we aim to try and stimulate new business opportunities, uh, especially for small to medium sized enterprises, but also learn about best practice in marine ecosystem restoration uh, from uh, established businesses, such as those providing nature based solutions for flood protection uh, from offshore oil and gas, uh, from renewable energies and also from deep sea mining. Okay. So the way that we can try and do this, because it's a very much a new business and it's a knowledge business, um, there is a challenge on how we go about this. And so the way we're doing this is by producing uh, focused newsletters, which you can find on our website. Uh, we run these webinars and we respond to requests. And, and also on our website, you'll find case studies in uh, active projects at the moment in marine ecosystem restoration. So if you want to be kept informed about uh, developments in Mercies, particularly in this uh, really quite rather hectic final year, then do please send us a message uh, at the website, uh, the um, email site uh, that you can see here. Uh, we really, it's a club, although it's called a business club that we're trying to uh, chain or make here, it includes everybody that might have an interest in marine ecosystem restoration. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our two speakers uh, for today. Uh, so we welcome Annemette Jorgensen from North Sea Futures. Um, which is an independent and not-for-profit company and network organization based in Denmark, and Daphne Cavillier of the Marine and Environmental Sciences Center, Instituto do Mar at the University of the Azores. Each of them will talk for about 20 minutes, and uh, Anna Meta will go first, and then we'll have the opportunity maybe of having a couple of questions after that, uh, before moving to Daphne's talk. We'll also do 20 minutes and then at the end of our meeting for about 15 minutes we'll have an open discussion uh, about both talks. The important thing is that we really do want to have your interaction as listeners uh, but at the same time we've got many listeners uh, now up to 56 uh, and so what we have opted for is a moderated discussion. Uh, and this has proved to be successful in past webinars. So in your Zoom window, you should be able to see uh, either at the top or the bottom, a, a banner with, uh, which includes a Q&A logo. You click on the Q&A logo and a dialogue box appears. 
And if you wish to write or ask a question, please would you write in this dialog box, which everyone then can see. Uh, and uh, this can be done at any time. So it can be done uh, during the talks. And in fact, that helps me as a moderator to see the questions coming in uh, rather than waiting for suddenly a whole load of questions coming in within a minute uh, at the end of a talk. Um, I will collect those questions together, some sort of community questions, uh, and uh, that, that seems to work okay. Now, also at the bottom of the Q&A box, you should be able to see, oh, I although I can't see it myself at the moment, a way of making your questions anonymous, or you can identify them as to coming from yourself. Um, so the questions, I, what we found is generally there are more questions than we can deal with in the, in the time that we have for this webinar. So what we do is that we collate all the questions and then we ask our speakers to respond to them and we put these uh, on the Mercy's website, the responses and the questions, so that everyone can see them. And you'll be informed when they appear on our website uh, uh, by email. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over now to Annemette Jorgensen uh, for her talk about decommissioning and marine ecosystem restoration. Over to you, Annemette. Yes. Good afternoon, everybody. I'll uh, try to share my slides with you so you can all see them. Um, hope that works. There we go. Well, thank you for the invitation, David, uh, to uh, do this talk. Um, as you already said, I've been working with the topic of uh, North Sea decommissioning and marine ecosystems for about 10 years. So it's something that I've come to feel quite strongly about. Um, <clears throat> in opposition, I think, to many uh, other people, because to many people, I think offshore decommissioning seems like a distant problem with very little impact on their personal lives. And to me, in reality, I think it is an incredible challenge that will affect most of us, at least indirectly, because we as taxpayers are paying more than 50% of the costs, actually everywhere in the world. Uh, for people living in coastal areas, it may even have direct impacts, and certainly for fishermen, through onshore waste management and through impacts on the availability of fish and shellfish, in surrounding waters and for the fishermen uh, on the, uh, their ability to fish in certain waters. Globally, um, there are uh, more than 7,500 fixed structures that will have to be decommissioned over the next 30 to 50, 40 years, with more than 37,000 wells that will have to be plugged and made safe for abandonment. The costs of this exercise have been estimated to somewhere above $200 billion, and probably that's an underestimation, but we still don't know. In the North Sea alone, we are talking about more than 600 fixed structures, 7,000 wells, and more than 45,000 kilometers of cables and pipelines. In terms of materials, this amounts to more than 5 million tons of steel and even more concrete, plus an unknown amount of copper, plastic, steel, and aluminium from cables and pipelines. The costs are expected to exceed $100 billion just in the North Sea area. The legal frameworks for how to decommission an offshore oil and gas, <coughs> oil and gas field properly <coughs> greatly differ among countries. In the US, for example, it is possible to reuse rigs as artificial reefs if they are suitable for this purpose. Whereas in the North Sea, the basic principle is that everything has to be removed. Many other parts of the world still haven't really created their legal frameworks yet, and are looking to the US or to the North Sea area to see what works best. So what does decommissioning actually mean in practice? Some of you, the, you may already know this, but um, since I don't know who all of you are, uh, I thought it, I'd better take this, uh, also explain this briefly. Um, first of all, it's important to realize that decommissioning is a process that may, take, <clears throat> that may take years to plan and implement. And that with our current regulations in the North Sea, decommissioning decisions are 
not primarily being taken on basis of environmental criteria or concerns, but on technical cost and safety considerations. In all cases, decommissioning implies that the installation is disconnected from the wells and that all the wells are plugged <coughs> so that they will not leak oil or gas in the future. Next, the top side is removed, sometimes in one piece and sometimes in smaller pieces. Usually, it is taken to shore for cleaning and waste handling, and sometimes it may be reused elsewhere, but this is certainly not the standard. For the part of the structure that is under the water, the jacket, there are several theoretical options. Full removal, either to a designated reef area or reuse elsewhere, or to shore for waste handling and recycling. Partial removal, where <clears throat> the top part can either be taken to shore for waste handling and recycling, or the top part can be reefed next to the bottom part. Toppling in place of the jacket, so you just put it down, um, line down, so that it doesn't stick out of the water anymore. Those are, they say, the three uh, major options. Of course, there's also an option of taking a jacket to the deep sea, but that is, um, I think, an option that, at least in, in uh, the Western world, is uh, not used anywhere anymore. Finally, pipelines and cables are either removed or trenched, and the seabed is cleaned of any debris so that other users can safely use the area again. In some cases, drill cutting piles underneath the structure and around the structure also need to be handled in some way or other. They contain high levels of hydrocarbons and other toxic chemicals and therefore may pose a serious threat to the marine environment. Once everything has been removed, the area is opened up to other users. And of course, if not everything is being removed, then it's also sometimes opened up to other users, but under different conditions. Unless installations are, part are partially left in place, or there is a significant amount of seabed contamination, there is no specific post-decommissioning mon monitoring of the area, at least not in the North Sea area. This means that, in fact, we often don't know how the environment in a decommissioned field develops over time. In the North Sea area, or the OSPAR area, there is not much to choose when it comes to decommissioning of the jacket. Full removal to shore is a default option, with some room for derogations for the footings, so only the absolute bottom part of the jacket, of extremely large structures, and for concrete structures like, for example, most of the structures in the Brent field. In total, some 130 structures are now applicable for derogation, all of them in the Northern North Sea. In the future, this may change, may be reduced to a smaller amount of structures if we continue along the path of reducing or minimizing the room for derogations within the OSPAR regulations. For all other structures, full removal to shore is the only option, which means that this is also the only option being considered in environmental impact assessments around decommissioning. Because in an environmental impact assessment, you only need to consider the option that you have actually chosen beforehand. That's also why I say we are actually not choosing on the basis of environmental criteria, but we're choosing first on technical and cost criteria, and then we make an environmental impact assessment of that option that we have chosen. For pipelines and drill cutting piles, regulations are more diverse, being <coughs> regulated not on OSPAR level, but on, OS on um, country levels which means that it opens up for the possibility of leaving them in place. Um, for drill cutting piles, in fact, this is the most commonly chosen option. When environmental impacts of decommissioning are assessed in an environmental impact assessment, they have to be assessed only for the decommissioning option that has already been chosen. That means that we have comparative assessments only for structures for which derog a derogation is requested, and then only for partial removal options where only the footings are left in place, not for options where a whole jacket, for instance, would be left in place, perhaps even sticking out of the water. Secondly, assessments tend to focus on the more traditional <clears throat> parameters being here on the on the left side of the, of the screen with the, with the green, uh, green markers. 
um, as energy use emissions and the impact of other you impact on other users which is essentially not really an environmental impact i would say when it comes to biodiversity effects the focus is on potentially negative effects of the activities related to decommissioning so really the cutting and the uh, vessel activity that kind of thing the things that you have to do in order to remove the structure um, and to the effect of leaving elements of the structure in place if you have to do that this has to do with the fact that impacts are assessed in relation to a baseline being the pre-construction situation which was very different from the situation where and that we have once we have had a structure for standing there for say 30 years within north sea futures we um, <clears throat> did a, an expert survey with uh, where we got responses from about 40 p 40 experts environmental experts from across the world um, and the result of that survey suggested that actually current practice may not deliver the best results for the environment. At least the experts clearly have a different opinion about that. Almost all of them agreed that a more flexible case by case approach would benefit the environment and that decommissioning options should be evaluated for groups of installations rather than for individual installations only. Their preference for decommissioning options where parts of the jacket would be left in place were just as strong as for the full removal option. And they considered full removal to shore only preferable if the materials were also reused or recycled. On the other hand, they also expressed a strong preference for removal of contaminated parts of an installation such as storage, storage, storage tanks that cannot be cleaned in place. And interestingly, the least preferred option was indeed the old Brent Spar proposal, complete removal and relocation to deep water, which is quite logical because then you are probably not getting a very interesting new ecosystem if you do that. They also ranked biodiversity related criteria much higher than the more traditional EIA criteria and clearly approach decommissioning <clears throat> with another baseline in mind than the pre-construction baseline. They look especially at the situation that has developed while the structure was there rather than the pre-construction situation where there was no, uh, no, yeah, no structure. Um, <clears throat> that means that they look really at the loss of the reef habitats, the biodiversity, the protection of strolling, uh, developed community, that kind of things that have developed over time. Instead of saying, okay, there used to be nothing, so now we just go back to nothing and it doesn't matter anymore. So why is that, That's this, uh, that people, <laughs> that experts have such a different view? I think one of the reasons is that <clears throat> once they are there, offshore structures become part of the wider ecosystem. They start providing services to this ecosystem that may fundamentally influence the way it functions. It pro by providing a reef habitat, for instance, these structures promote the development of certain species, perhaps at the cost of others, um, and they allow for additional biomass creation. This may lead to changes in nutrient availability, water quality, and food webs. And that change is continuing for 30 years, so the wider ecosystem actually adapts to the presence of these offshore structures. And when we take them away, we can assume that things will just go back to the way that things were 30 years ago, but we actually don't know because we don't know what has all changed in the meantime and also why the conditions may have changed. Moreover, offshore installations are interconnected by tidal flows as is shown here on the, on the top part for a range of species. This is by the way uh, from a presentation of the anchor project that has been done within the INSIGHT program that is now getting into its uh, second phase. Not, not my own uh, project, but uh, 
as a figures uh, shared by uh, Leon Henry. Um, so thanks to her for doing that. Um, it's being shown here, uh, the colored areas is where you see uh, interconnectivity between Lophelia corals on, on, the, on the most left side, um, <clears throat> mussels uh, next to its soft coral, anemones and barnacles. So you see that especially the um, Lophelia and the mussels have a very strong interconnectivity uh, across the North Sea. And some of them, in particular, <coughs> the Lophelia, are even interconnected with protected natural reefs. That's what we see on the bottom right side. Um, on the map there, the purple area illustrates the larval flow of Lophelia from oil installations, and the little green and red dots and lines are natural protected Lophelia reefs. So you see that in a few areas, these um, actually connect to each other. And that means that larvae from the oil and gas installation move on to the natural reefs. As already mentioned, there are very few environmental impact assessments in which the environmental impacts of different decommissioning options are actually compared. And when they are, they hardly ever look at the biodiversity impact of the loss of habitat and no fishing zones that are inherently a result of full removal to shore. Within Noisy Futures, we try to do a general assessment of the potential differences in environmental impacts of partial removal versus full removal. It's very general assessment, of course, um, but still I think it's, it's better than nothing and it gives an impression of the different impacts that play a role and how they play a role in the different types of, uh, of approaches. What we learned from this exercise was that there are major differences in the impacts of different decommissioning options and that <clears throat> there is currently little environmental rationale for the preference of full removal to shore. Of course, there can be a rationale because you want to make sure that the area is reopened to, for example, fisheries again, but that's a different story, I would say. Full removal to shore only has a clear environmental benefit when it comes to resource recovery and avoided energy use following recycling of steel. Habitat damage from scattering debris, regained space for other users, especially fisheries, and loss of interconnectivity for invasive species. On all the other parameters, leaving structures partially in place either, either has a similar or lower impact if we take the current ecosystem <clears throat> as a baseline rather than the often somewhat speculative situation of what it was like 30 years ago. Even when it comes to the impact of contaminants, it is questionable whether full removal to shore really provides significant benefits. Most steel jackets are not contaminated. That's an important thing to realize. And even when a structure is contaminated, like the parent installations are, for instance, it might in fact pose a larger risk to the environment to take them to shore than to leave them where they are. For example, in Norway, when I interviewed stakeholders there, they were very concerned about the fact that some contaminants uh, may be much easier diluted far offshore than when they get into the Norwegian fjords where there are no, not so much, uh, much less currents and that kind of things to spread them and, and, and dilute them. This is certainly the case when drill cuttings are being left in place because a partially removed installation will help to keep trawlers away and will otherwise disperse the pollution over a larger area. So to conclude, I think personally it is really time to first of all make sure that we know, get to know more about the impacts of environmental, of environmental impacts of decommissioning. There is still a whole lot of things we do not know about this. Decommissioning impacts do have a negative impact on the environment. That's also a very important thing to realize. And I think especially something to take in, into account in the design, uh, in the original design, to see if we can somehow design structures for minimal decommissioning. This may especially be something to think about when we talk about offshore wind rather than offshore oil and gas. 
The environmental impacts of decommissioning options also differ, especially on the biodiversity related criteria. There is no one best option, and I think that's a very important thing to realize, because that best option depends on how we value various impacts and what we take as our baseline. Do we take our baseline as being what the ecosystem was like 30 years ago when there was nothing, or do we take the new situation where the structure is there as the baseline where we, that we are actually changing when we take things away? Full removal to shore as default option may not deliver the best results for the environment. Of course, again, this depends on how you, <clears throat> on how you value the, the various impacts and what we take as a baseline. We need to better understand the role of offshore structures in providing ecosystem services and how removal affects them. And preferably we need to understand that before we have actually removed them because then it's too late. The baseline, as I said, I don't think pre-construction conditions will always serve as a good baseline for decommissioning after 15 years. The ecosystem around, or the ecosystem, why the ecosystem may have changed, and also sometimes the pre-construction condition, pre conditions were actually worse than many uh, ecosystem uh, conditions are now. Rather, we should take something like a good environmental status or uh, a, a picture of what we would actually like the North Sea ecosystem to be like in the future, take that as a baseline and see how offshore structures and decommissioning can contribute to achieving that kind of goal. Um, decommissioning should be considered within the wider context of marine ecosystem restoration, I think, not as an isolated action. That means again, Look at what it is that we want to achieve with the North Sea ecosystem. What kind of species do we want to promote? What kind of species do we not want to promote? How do they relate to these um, <clears throat> structures? And what does it mean when we take them away or partially leave them in place? And when we do full removal to shore, we should really focus on maximizing reuse and recycling. There are lots of <clears throat> structures and or parts of structures now not really being, being reused or recycled properly. Um, and then in that case, I think we are primarily transferring an environmental problem from sea to land, which can be useful, but also often not very useful. So in short, I think it's time for a more flexible ecosystem appro based approach to uh, decommissioning um, and for uh, continuing a lot more work to make sure that we better understand what offshore structures really mean for uh, how they impact the wider ecosystem. Thank you very much for your attention. And um, I hope uh, we can get some, some good questions and also uh, that I can answer some of them. And uh, please feel free to also contact me later if you want that. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Anna Meta. And uh, yes, there have been questions flowing in uh, for you. Um, so, uh, and I'm not quite sure how to switch my. Uh, oh, here we are. Let's go down. I think I have it now. Oh, there we go. And um, so, the first one, I think, I think we should address. I'll try and address the one to do with the ISA in, in a moment. Um, but uh, in terms of your talk. Um, you obviously said nothing at some stage, but you corrected that on your final slide there about that the conditions when uh, as a baseline 15 or you know at the start of operations probably wasn't the best time to uh, aim for that that's not the best baseline you can you can have it wasn't that there's nothing there it was just depauperate in some way um, and so I was wondering whether Apart from your uh, solution is that, well, let's take a different view and not have baselines. It's a, it's a different, it's a, it's, a, it's a baseline now that you start to, to look at. Um, are there other times in, his, in the history of the North Sea, uh, really, that we do have some information about what it looked like from historical records, perhaps, uh, uh, that would actually serve as a good baseline uh, to aim for? Yeah. Uh, that's a very good question, and and of course uh, there was not nothing uh, before before the structures. Um, and yes, we do have uh, quite a lot of information 
on historical situations, uh, especially in particular in the, in the southern part of the North Sea, for instance, there used to be a huge oyster bank um, all across the North Sea to the, to the UK. And we were really connected, not only by the EU. Um, <clears throat> and um, I think that's, that's a typical example of how indeed ecosystems are changing over time and also how, say, how influenced the North Sea ecosystem as such is, uh, has been by humans in general. Um, now most of it is, is sand. Uh, there are still, still a few boulder reefs and, and of course at the coasts uh, also some, some, some larger, I say really uh, so some, some, uh, some hard reefs uh, left here and there. And in the northern part indeed there are quite a lot of Lophelia reefs but they are also being destroyed, often destroyed by, um, by, uh, by trawling. Yeah. and have been destroyed by trawling. Okay, well we'll maybe come back to the other questions here uh, in a little while. Thank you very much for your talk uh, and now we will move on to Daphne Cuvillier uh, in the Azores. Um, so I think you have to unshare your screen first. Yep, I have, yes. It can be organized uh, and so we're moving on uh, to Daphne. Here we are. Okay, and you need to put your video on, Daphne, if you could, please. Yeah, there you go. There we go. Thank you very much. Thank you for the introduction. And um, hi, everybody. I will be talking about uh, possible mitigation and restoration actions for mining impacts in the deep sea. Uh, and this was based upon a workshop that was done within the MIDAS project, the EU funded project on managing impacts of deep sea resource exploitation. It also resulted in uh, the, the article you can see here, published in Frontiers of Marine Science, in which all the co-authors were also participants in the workshop. So to give a little overview of my talk, I will be starting off with a, an introduction of the deep sea ecosystems that are at risk, uh, the type of mining activities and the possible impact. Then I will be talking a little bit about the recurrent mitigation restoration actions um, across ecosystems. And then there will be some case specific or ecosystem specific action, actions uh, discussed as well, followed by the conclusions. So first of all, we have the hydrothermal vents that will be targeted uh, for polymetallic sulfides. So we have active hydrothermal vents, which are hotspots for the biomass. They have a highly specific fauna that relies on chemosynthesis. There's a high spatial variability as well, and they're considered extreme environments and they're also uh, ephemeral. Then we have the inactive uh, hydrothermal vents, which are supposedly more abundant, but they're far less studied. Uh, those that were studied were shown to host remnants of hydrothermal vent fauna, as well as more cement-like fauna. With that, we mean suspension feeders and filter feeders and so on. If these hydrothermal vents are to be mined, the edifices will be excavated uh, to collect the polymetallic sulfides. So the resource removal actually means the habitat removal as well as uh, removal of the associated fauna and mortality. Um, in this case, there are also elevated risks uh, of clogging the fluid exits, um, which means that there will be no energy source left for the remaining chemosynthetic fauna. The post-processing plumes dis plume discharge um, will be different as well from the natural hydrothermal vent plumes, both in composition and in extent. Uh, a second one are the polymet polymetallic nodules that, are, uh, that can be found on the abyssal plains. Uh, there's a high variety in density of nodules, as you can see on the images here. Um, they offer a specific hard substratum for the fauna to colonize in an otherwise soft sediment uh, deep sea habitat. Uh, they also have a specific associated megafauna, and they're considered very stable environments. Um, as of now, it's still unknown if the metal components within the nodules have an effect on the microbial colonization and the other final colonizations. Um, when you consider possible mining actions, the nodules will be removed um, from the deep sea floor, which means that the hard substrata will be removed as well, as well as the fauna um, living on these nodules. Uh, in addition, um, the upper layer of the surrounding soft sediment will be disturbed and removed as, or removed as well during mining actions. 
The post-processing bloom discharge will be different in composition and extent uh, from ambient seawater or any natural sediment flows that we know. The third one are the uh, ferromanganese crusts that we can find on seamounts. Um, seamounts are known to host long-living organisms such as arborescent corals. Um, there is a high spatial variability between the seamounts. Uh, we're not sure if there are um, the fauna occupying these seamounts are there because of the metal components in the crust or just of the texture. And seamounts also have a specific uh, pelagic aggregations that we need to take into account. Uh, mining of this crust is probably at the moment the most technically challenging still because the crusts need to be cut and separated from the intergrown substrate. Here as well, the habitat removal uh, will impact the fauna living on the habitats um, and the plume discharge will be different than ambient seawater and will alter the natural hydrodynamics occurring around the seamount. During the workshop, we also discussed um, methane gas hydrides, hydrates, which you can find in our cold seeps, uh, which is another chemosynthetic environment. They're also uh, characterized by uh, high biomass, high specific fauna, but because they don't have any temperature gradients, um, they, um, there is more uh, other deep sea fauna, or background fauna coming in as well. But they do have a very large extent of influence as well. Um, if methane gas hydrates should be mined, uh, they will happen through drilling in the seafloor to pumping up the hydrates from the underlying reservoir. Uh, in this case, resource removal equates an energy source removal for the chemosynthetic fauna. So there is no restoration possible for the chemosynthetic fauna in this scenario. There's an additional risk of slumping and collapsing of the, the ecosystem and the plume discharge um, imp will impact uh, everything as well. And there's the additional chance of leakage when pumping up the hydrates as well. Now, because there is no um, strict restoration possible for the chemosynthetic fauna, uh, I will not be going into detail in the cold seeps in this talk. So these mining actions that I just uh, showed you will all have effects on the ecosystem with the mortality of the fauna, habitat loss, habitat modification and habitat fragmentation. Um, all of these are intertwined. I did not show all the relationships possible, but there are some examples given since that habitat modification can also lead to mortality of fauna habitat loss as well, but mortality of fauna can also mean habitat loss for other organisms and so on. Um, in order to counteract these effects on the ecosystem, uh, we came up with a number of actions uh, in which uh, some of them are aimed to mitigate possible impacts and others aim to aid to help and restore uh, or recover an ecosystem that has been degraded, um, damaged or destroyed. Um, these actions are all proposed within the mitigation hierarchy, uh, which is often used in environmental impact assessment studies. Um, and they um, aim to, in this order, avoid, minimize, restore, or compensate. Um, during this talk, main emphasis will lie on the restoration, but however, um, they cannot be seen separate from one another. So I will also will be introducing um, um, the actions that fit within the avoidance and minimization character um, categories as well, and then um, more emphasis on the restoration action. Uh, just a little word about uh, the offsetting or compensation. Um, I won't be going into detail about that one because it involves the no net loss of biodiversity, um, something which is unachievable for the deep sea using just remediation and um, offsetting at this point. So these are the lists that we came up with. Um, it's not my idea to have you read everything of this, but I just color coded uh, the ones that um, were similar across the different ecosystems as well. Uh, while making this list, we were not restricted by limited knowledge on ecological feasibility or costs, because otherwise this list would be far shorter. Um, so I will be starting up with an avoidance action, which is the the indication and implementation or refuge or set aside or no-take areas. Um, from an ecological point of view, this is probably the most uh, important one because it means that we actually maintain completely functional ecosystems um, that are not disturbed at all. Um, for these ecosystems, uh, we should take into account the representativity, how similar are they to the mine areas. This also means that areas that um, are put aside will host high resource densities as well because they need to be similar to the possible mined areas. 
Uh, this is illustrated by this beautiful uh, figure made by Alton Purser, in which the A is actually indicated for the nodule fields as being a not suitable um, refuge area and B, a suitable area hosting the similar densities of nodules uh, as the mined area. Uh, another question is the size of the area we need to take in, in, in consideration as well, as well as the distance from the mine side. Um, it's supposed, it, I mean, refuge areas should um, not be subject to any impacts, so it should be far enough from a mine side, but it should possibly play a role um, in a subsequent recolonizations of mined areas, meaning that it, has, it can't be very distant um, either. In the minimization category, there are two um, main groups that we identified. One are spatial temporal restrictions and the other one is the limits of the plume extent. For the spatial temporal restrictions, um, these aim to limit habitat fragmentations uh, by, for instance, maximizing the size of the mine areas plus the geographic location in order to avoid uh, fragmentation of the habitat. We also should consider seasonal closures um, in, in seasons in which uh, uh, organisms reproduce or there are migratory animals passing through the area and so on. We also limit the duration of the mining operations and prevent uh, post-mining human activities. Uh, for the plume extent, the limitations of the primary excavation plume, which is the, the plume um, created by the excavation of the mining vehicle, uh, it's a clever engine design that should be considered with lightweight engines and uh, possible shrouds for um, contention of the excavation plume. This is illustrated by the figure F within this illustration, which you can see uh, a nodule collector equipped with shrouds containing the, the primary excavation plume. Uh, secondly, the secondary post-processing discharge plume should be limited as well. This can be done by changing the composition of the plume in order to make it more similar as possible to the ambient seawater. Uh, the size of the particles in this plume should be, um, should be discussed as well because a too large of a size makes it harder for um, uh, organisms to colonize once they've settled down on the seafloor and a small, too small size of particles will clog the feeding uh, apparatus of the filter feeders. Uh, temperature and sal salinity should be uh, as close to the ambient seawater as possible. Um, the use of a dilution the gradient and release, different release depths can be considered as well. And the metal pre precipitation should be increased on board uh, the, the, the processing vessels in order to make it as less toxic as possible. Um, also, the waste sediment could be returned to the deep sea floor by, for instance, using biodegradable sediment bags or rapidly sinking bricks. Of course, this sediment composition will be different from the one that it was originally um, um, mined. Um, and we should um, pay attention that when these bricks or bags are sunk from a vessel, uh, that we're not smothering the, the final communities at the deep sea floor. And also, once they've dropped to the deep sea floor, they can cause changes in hydrodynamic conditions due to their shape and form. This is illustrated uh, within the figure C for the nodule fields as well. And then we come to the restoration actions. Um, so these actions are aimed to aid in the recovery uh, of the ecosystem from fauna mortality and habitat loss. So first of all, we have the, the, an action to guarantee food availability. This could include baits or adding in organic matter. Um, increased food availability should favor growth and reproduction and could possibly accelerate succession. However, we need to watch out because if the input is too high, there are risks of hypoxia, acidification and eutrophication. Secondly, is the use or the deployment of uh, artificial colonization substrata, which can be used to provide additional suitable habitats for the fauna to occupy. However, there's a low predictability and uh, based on the composition of the substrata, it might alter the natural community composition as well. And we have, uh, of course, there's also the, the question mark on how many substrata do we need to deploy in order to uh, assist in recovering an ecosystem or recreating, recreating a viable ecosystem. The third one is the transplant of fauna. This one includes actually larval seeding or larval showering as well. 
Um, and the idea is to increase the colonization potential of the mine area by um, transplanting a functional assemblage or engineering um, species um, or facilitators that can kickstart subsequent uh, colonization. Main questions for these kind of actions remain where from and where to do we transport them and how do we transport them? Uh, first of all, we need to take into account uh, the natural barriers, barriers such as depth thresholds and transform walls. Uh, we need to watch out to not reduce any genetic diversity or introduce invasive species. And of course, especially for the larv larval seeding and showering, um, the settlement success always remains a uh, question mark. Um, the artificial colonization substrata are illustrated for the nodule fields by figure E, which shows artificial nodules and artificial sponge stalks. And the figure D shows the, the transplant of the, the fauna carried out by a, a submersible. Uh, the positive part of these restoration actions is that these are experiments possible to increase our knowledge on these in pos prob um, possible in early exploration phases. Right? And in this way, I would also like to introduce the work done here by our colleagues in the US, which have been working on the feasibility of testing the feasibility of various techniques of cold water coral transportations. Um, and they can say that, yes, it is feasible. However, it depends largely on the species of coral uh, that is being transplanted, uh, its condition, if it's intact, injured, intoxicated, or both, it, also have a, it all has an impact on the, the success of their survival. And it also depends on the site and the surrounding coral density, how successful they are. And overall, the species that show some kind of um, signs of survival, they take a long time to recover. Um, and then we go to some case specific examples per ecosystem for the active hydrothermal vents. It is an avoidance action that is actually uh, to avoid clogging, um, meaning that when, when a fluid exit gets clogged, uh, the fluids will seek for another way out. But when doing so, their composition can change and their subsequent colonization um, can change as well. Okay, Daphne, I think we're going to have to end fairly soon. Yeah, I'll, this is my, my last slide before the conclusion, so okay. I'm, I'm nearly done. Um, then uh, we can recreate hydrothermal vents by drilling. Uh, however, drilling pits were shown to be short living and the funnel colonization um, changes as well uh, over the long term as well. Um, then we could restore sulfide to strata. The idea was to put a consolidation tower on top of an active hydrothermal vent to help precipitation of the sulfide substrata, making them more suitable for fauna colonization. For the nodule fields, um, the thought was to allow fauna to pass through a collector unharmed, uh, which is actually an, uh, an example of the, the, the dredging industry. This will only be uh, suitable for a certain number of taxa, which are more resistant and uh, of a certain size fraction as well. Of course, we don't know their condition after they pass through a collector and soon they'll be pretty shaken up and they also come into a disturbed ecosystem. So the success of their survival remains to be um, questioned. Then artificial nodule response stocks as a, an artificial substrata, which I already mentioned. Also, the, the vehicle uh, passing through, uh, collecting the nodules, could mold the sediments that are resuspended by its passage in lumps by, and leaving it behind the mining vehicle. Uh, the, the, the tracks um, carried out by the, by the collectors could be uh, raked out in order to, to level out the tracks. Uh, this is an example of uh, one of those tracks, which is more than decades old, and it's still very, very visible. And in, especially in this uh, ecosystem, avoid excessive compactation. For the sea mounts, we propose to increase the rigosity of the bind substrate, in the sense that the texture might play a role in uh, final settlement as well. So as a conclusion, there is no single restoration or mitigation action that will suffice. Instead, combined measures should be taken into account. Yeah, Daphne, uh, can you just maybe go through and put all those up on the screen? Yeah. And then they, everyone can see those while you're answering some okay. questions. I think that will help us in terms of the timing now. So yeah, just to okay. say that different actions, different settings will require different actions, which also mean that there's need to be additional actions considered uh, based on the local peculiarities of the ecosystem. 
and this is important as well, that none of the restoration strategies outlined here are derived from practical experience. Although the, um, I'd like to highlight the, the transplant experiment done by, by our institute and our colleagues within the MERSIS project. Um, some of these experiences could be included in early exploration phases in order to increase our knowledge. And actually it's important as well that we actually have a lack of studies featuring real mining impacts. Um, a couple of years ago, there have been some mining studies mimicking mining impacts, but now that it comes, the, the, the mining turns more real, uh, we can see that it actually has nothing to see with the, the earlier uh, disturbance um, studies. So we have no knowledge on the exact type and the extent of the, the impacts on the farm. And that's it for me. So. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Well, you, you, you've done a great job there, uh, particularly since you are, have answered one of the questions already <laughs> in what you said, and that was, uh, were there any successful cases of restoration uh, yeah. in these habitats? And uh, the answer generally is no, uh, but there are a few experiments uh, that are starting now. Um, so th that's very useful for that, and, uh, and hopefully this will be a spur maybe to uh, those involved in deep sea mining during the exploration phase of their work that they really do need to be considering their whole environmental plan which would include restoration at least in some part of the uh, ecosystems that they're impacting uh, and i think that's important some uh, that, that comes out of this so daphne i have a, another question here which is um to what extent do you think the restoration actions really have their own impact? Are, are we, are we, what we're doing or what we could do in restoration, um, you know, will, will that be useful or will it have additional changes that, that will happen with time? Um, the thing is that we actually don't know. Um, and I think it also depends on the ecosystem. I think there are probably some ecosystems that would be prone to much more changes. For instance, the hydrothermal vents. Um, I'm just thinking about the substrata deployments. Um, depending on the type of substrata used, uh, there's a chance of introducing other fauna than the original endemic uh, hydrothermal vent fauna. So yeah, I think certain restoration action do open up um possibilities for changing environments afterwards it's really hard i think the hardest part is to actually turn back the time and go back to the original ecosystem that was mined to have an exact recreation of that one i think it's going to be very complicated okay um the other point i would make is that we've had several questions here which maybe aren't specifically to do with restoration but which i do have answers for uh, but we don't have time to address them here um, and, and I will do that uh, as part of our response on the Mercy's website. But if you want uh, to know earlier than that, um, these questions have come from either one or more anonymous attendees. And I can't send you a message unless I know who you are. So what I would suggest is that you actually email me with these questions. Uh, and I'm more than happy to be able to try and answer them for you. Um, what I would like to do... Uh, is maybe to go back to a couple of questions uh, for Anna Meta uh, here. Um, and it was to do with the ecosystem service attributes, uh, ecosystem services and uh, as a basis for ecosystem attributes. Um, so that's quite a complex thing. How would you measure, you know, what are the, what are the important e ecosystem attributes, characteristics, functions? Uh, how do you make that decision uh, as to what you what your your measure would be? Yeah, that's a that's a very good question, and um, I must say I I don't have a very clear answer to that. I think essentially it's a it's a matter of stakeholders and scientists uh, having a, a broader discussion within the North Sea area and within the Os Osprey area about what kind of ecosystem it is that we would like to have in the North Sea and indeed what kind of species we would uh, what kind of species we would like to to promote and then what kind of ecosystem services are needed for that um, i think there's one of the other questions mentioning that indeed um, offshore structures are not natural parts of the ecosystem mm. and in that sense it's rather about supporting ecosystem services than about providing them i think that's that's correct um, I absolutely agree with that. On the 
at the same time, I think it's important to realize that, especially with the energy transition and the amount of offshore wind we are now planning to build in the North Sea, um, these structures become such a large part of the ecosystem that they may actually be very, become very determinant for the conditions that the ecosystem are functioning under. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, some of some scenarios are actually uh, considering uh, really reserving. I think it's about twenty percent of the North Sea for uh, for offshore wind, and that will have a huge effect. And especially if we are also going to take these structures out every twenty years when the permits have uh, mm. have uh, stopped. Okay, I have a follow-up question uh, related to that. Uh, and that is basically it comes down to well are these rigs that might be turned into reefs in the right place to actually assist the wider uh, recovery of the uh, of the North Sea uh, and in addition to that uh, maybe some other artificial reefs uh, would need to go into place to make a proper network uh, and how would you pay for that uh, well perhaps through an environmental fund for the new North Sea where everyone who's involved in this work, uh, uh, companies and governments, uh, can fund that. So that would be a way of maybe getting a, a proper network uh, uh, around the North Sea rather than just one based on these rigs. Well, I think that would indeed be an absolutely ideal, um, ideal way of, of doing that. I think it's, it's absolutely right that many of these structures are not by themselves in the right place to really perform a, a maximum positive impact um, and some of the ones that are not that uh, maybe they are still okay to have there uh, simply because it costs less to remove them and it doesn't really de deliver a proper environmental benefit to remove them and in that case it would be certainly very good idea to say okay then part of the cost savings that are quite substantial um, they go into a fund that you can then use to uh, to create actual to restore natural reefs actively and, and indeed also to create new artificial reefs. And perhaps you can also use some of the structures that you do want to remove uh, as a basis for, a, for an artificial reef. Mm -hmm. That's, um, okay. But then you don't save any, any costs anymore. That's important to realize. <laughs> All right. Uh, so I um, have probably now one final question, unless people go, uh, add any other questions in. Uh, this is your last opportunity. Uh, and it comes from one of our anonymous attendees who are saying, well, how, how willing are companies in deep sea mining uh, willing to, to be part of these new approaches? I suppose it also applies actually to you, Anometa, uh, in the North Sea. So how willing are companies to be part of these new approaches and experiments to show best solutions? Um, so maybe Animati, you can start off, maybe because uh, there's the Insight program uh, and, and, and certainly in the UK, there's uh, been an announcement yesterday of a new research program for 4.2 million uh, to address all these issues in the North Sea. Um, so do you want to say something about how that's organized in the North Sea and maybe Daphne you might like to say something about deep sea mining? Yeah, I'll try to be brief. Um, so Daphne gets some time too. Um, I think it's uh, it, the inside program is clearly an example of uh, at least oil and gas companies being very interested in uh, figuring out what the impacts of, of decommissioning are and really to understand the effects of the offshore structures. Um, when it comes to um, to actual, say, reefing, uh, changing decommissioning practices, I think it's absolutely crucial that uh, that they will only want to be involved if uh, if there's a resolving of the liabilities of what happens with structures mm. that are left in place. Okay, thank um, you. And perhaps also if there's to say costs, but that's uh, yeah, that's an uh, easier one. All right, and Daphne, do you know of uh, any way that companies are being involved in um, deep sea restoration studies? Oh. Well, you have the, the, the ISA guidelines, and I think that contractors are supposed to take those in consideration as well, but I'm sure you know that better than I do. <laughs> um, and uh, I think it's also um, uh, something about having um, 
have a good impression on the general public because it's actually, I mean, we have the law of the sea and everything. And I think it's in some cases, definitely in the, the enterprises are best um, interest to show uh, they're actually actively contributing in maintaining these uh, deep sea ecosystems viable or to, to preserve them. So I actually, it's, I, I hope they have something about a common sense on actually willingly trying to contribute in order to preserve our deep sea as well. Um, mm. Well, I, uh, the only one I know of is, and I think Nautilus Minerals did a, a, a great job because this was over 15 years ago now, where uh, as part of the Solwara One uh, project that they were involved with, um, uh, they did actually start to experiment on ways of restoring hydrothermal vent uh, uh, ecosystems um, that they might have impacted uh, during that time. So. Uh, it was very forward thinking. The trouble was that they ran out of uh, money and, and, and also, also management um, impetus, if you like, uh, mm -hmm. to continue the studies. So while the studies were set up, they've not actually been revisited uh, to see what effect this restoration action has taken. And so that is something for the world to, uh, to try and do maybe in the next uh, few years. But apart from that, I'm not aware of other companies starting to look at restoration and experiment and to try and say look we could try these methods to help ecosystems return to some sense of normality whatever that might be yeah. uh, faster than they might otherwise do but there is an absolute uh, opportunity uh, for this because the companies are for uh, polymetallic nodules are being uh, asked to run test mining uh, experiments to to look at what the impacts would be and those impacts will occur over quite a large area and there's no real reason why they shouldn't then use those experimental impacts to try different methods of restoration uh, to see whether there are any that are particularly successful or not um, so I think that's some work that uh, needs to be done in the future yeah, that's no, one of the things that I think it's it's really interesting as well to at least propose a certain number of quite feasible experiments. So they can say like, oh, we can give it a try easily, which is not too high of a cost. And I think, yeah, it's, it's in everybody's interest, actually. So. Okay. So as I see, we've actually maintained our audience. <laughs> Normally people start dropping off and, and you may want to do so now. But there are a couple of other questions that have come in. Uh, and they were learned to, uh, relate to Anna Meta, uh, uh talk. It says, what do you mean by flexible approach to managing the impact of man-made structures? Is that a phrase that you used? Yes, that's a phrase I, uh, I used, and that's uh, I was just uh, just working on on uh, on writing an answer, um, <laughs> but this is easier. Uh, what I mean with a flexible approach is an approach where we don't upfront make the choice for full removal or any other particular form of, um, of uh, decommissioning option, but where we say, okay, the decommissioning option should really be assessed per platform or per group of platforms. And then for that platform or that group of platforms, we can make a choice of what kind of decommissioning option is the best from an environmental perspective or from stakeholder perspectives, whatever uh, criteria you want to use uh, for that specific area. Okay. Well, I think probably we should call that a day. Um, first of all, thank you to everybody who did come and attend the uh, webinar. We were very appreciative of your audience. And uh, thank you also for those of you who contributed a question. And we will endeavor to have written responses to these questions and put them on the Mercy's website uh, and let you know when that has been done. Uh, we will hold two more webinars as part of the Mercy's project before about, well, probably in about October and January, October 2019, January 2020, uh, looking at various other economic issues around marine restoration like uh, blue uh, by carbon sequestration and blue carbon or, or also the effects on tourism and local communities um, so we hope you'll be able to join us for that and we look forward to seeing you next time thank you very much and goodbye <laughs>